Mark, <clears throat> you have an extensive background in business and in the tech space, but something that caught my eye is the fact that you are one of the best ballroom dancers in the country. Now, I don't know much about ballroom dancer or, uh, dancing. I do admire it, but in my mind, it conjures up the notion that you really have to work with other people and learn to use each other's respective strengths. It's a sport and an art form that requires agility, the ability to connect with people, lead, accountability and technique. Would that be correct? Very much so. I competed throughout my 20s and there I went to national championships for seven years straight. And certainly between you and your partner, you have to recognize your strengths. You have to, even though we very literally have <clears throat> a lead and a follow in ballroom. I am the uh -huh. man, I am the lead, she follows. But still, I'm at times going backwards, right? And she oh, has to yes. signal to me, you're about to collide into someone. So you have to have good give and take. So also, nice. even in training, so off the floor as we train, one of the best things to happen was being part of the MIT ballroom dance team because all of us together were pushing ourselves, pushing each other, and being part of a team with a lot of other A players really inspires you and pushes you to continue to improve. And that was a really great tailwind that helped me throughout my competitive career. Certainly. So would I be right in saying that in some ways, uh, the skills uh, and attitudes are picked up through your ballroom dancing experiences are really reflected in the book Career Toolkit, the essential skills for success that no one taught you? Certainly there are some pieces of it mm -hmm. that came in and, and helped me. I often give as an example, my public speaking, one of the things that really improved it was being a ballroom dancer. And right. it's not that you say anything on the dance floor, you're not talking. But yeah. what holds us back in public speaking, it's that fear, that fear of I'm gonna screw up, people are gonna laugh at me. And when you're on the ballroom floor competing, Everyone is watching you and you do screw up at times, but you just learn, yeah, okay, it's, I'm going to get through this. And it builds that confidence, which is really the basis of a lot of public speaking. Excellent. Now, for listeners, uh, I'm with Mark Hirschberg, who, like I said, has uh, extensive experience in business and in the tech space. But I guess currently you are a fractional CTO for various companies, in particular Avron. And I think most notably, as you've just mentioned, you've studied at MIT and started the Undergraduate Practice Opportunities Program, which is dubbed as MIT's Career Success Accelerator. Uh, and you teach that annually, is that correct? That's right. I've been teaching there now for the past 20 years. Excellent. I know that was a very brief introduction, Mark, but is there anything else that we should highlight uh, as part of your experience? Those are, are definitely the key aspects. I've also, as a CTO, I've worked in a number of different industries, including B2B and B2C, and I've worked in marketing and lead generation. I've worked in cybersecurity and authentication. I've worked in labor marketplaces, financial systems. So I've really had a diverse set of industries that I've been a part of. Now, Mark, if I remember correctly, the genesis for this book really started from your experiences in trying to hire new people into primarily the tech industry, where you discovered that they didn't have certain skills that really weren't being taught at schools. But I'm curious as to what point did you go, okay, I see there's a problem here, but now I need to teach it. It was early on. So when I knew I wanted to become a CTO, I wanted to get to the top of my career path, I said, okay, well, I know it's not just about being the best software developer. There are other skills. There's leadership, there's hiring, there's working with other departments. And I certainly didn't learn any of that with my computer science degree. Mm -hmm. So I figured out I need to develop these skills. And I started to develop them in myself. So it was a very proactive effort. When I recognized the importance of these skills, as I suspect most people understand, I didn't necessarily understand it back in college, and I would hire people I would first ask a technical question. Now for software engineers, it would literally be technical, but it could be an accounting question, a marketing question, whatever their discipline is. Mm -hmm. And I would get the right technical answer. They understood their discipline. Okay, great. Then I would ask questions during the interview, like what makes someone an effective teammate? What are the qualities you look for in a leader? And I would get blank stares. 
because again, most people haven't been taught this. I was just very conscious in learning it. I understood the power of it. And I recognized this was a widespread problem. Since I couldn't hire for people with the understanding, I had to train them up. So this is shortly after I began hiring and I recognized I should be looking for this. If I couldn't find it, I needed to build it. Mm -hmm. And so I started to put together materials to develop training programs. Now this is right around 2000. There was not the wealth of content that we have on the internet. We didn't have mm -hmm. great podcasts like this one. So I had to really go source materials. And that was, that was challenging. There weren't even probably as many books on the topics back then. Mm -hmm. And around the same time, I heard MIT was working on a similar program. So I had now been doing this for probably about a year and a half. I heard MIT was trying to approach this. So I reached out and said, you know, I've been working on this problem. Happy to share my, my learnings. Can I be of any help? They said, yes, please. Please come teach us what you know. <laughs> and certainly we had experts, right? We have leadership experts at Sloan, but they're not always practitioners. And so I brought in a different perspective. And they said, you know, your perspective is really unique. We would love for you to come help teach this class. And I and other people like me over the years have come and added into the theory that the professors bring, we bring the practical approach from having done this in the field. Okay. Uh, and this is obviously something that's fairly unique in that uh, not too many people get taught this and, and certainly not from a, a practical point of view. Is there... Is this something that organizations should actively be investing in? 100%. Let me give you a simple example. This is how I, I motivate my students. Let's take, we're gonna take one of the skills. Now these skills, by the way, this isn't just, well, Mark thinks this is important. This is feedback that we have gotten from corporate America saying we right. want people who are leaders, good teammates, strong communicators, good negotiators, good networkers, we want these skills and we're just not finding it. And that's what inspired the different topics in the class and in the book. So when I speak to my students, I say, okay, imagine the following. Imagine you spend a little time learning how to negotiate, not to become the world's best negotiator, mm -hmm. just get a little better at it. So now you take a job, you're right out of school, you get a job, they offer you, let's say $60,000 and you negotiate and you, you up it to 61,000. Okay, that, that sounds reasonable. That seems doable. If you do nothing else, if you sit in that job for 40 years, you got $1,000 more for 40 years. You just got $40,000. One five-minute negotiations, $40,000, right? That is a massive ROI. Now, of course, we all know you're not going to stay in that job for 40 years. You'll have raises, promotions, other jobs. We also know negotiations isn't just about the money. We're going to have negotiations with coworkers sometimes and finding good solutions. So if you could invest, let's say 10, 20 hours, read a negotiation book, take a class online, get just a little bit better in your negotiations, this can add hundreds of thousands of dollars to your lifetime earning. Mm -hmm. That's a no brainer. Now negotiations happen to be the most obvious example. So you literally got a thousand dollars more. But if you improve your leadership, your communications, improve your network, it's not that someone says, you're a better leader, here's $1,000 more, but they're going to say, hmm, he really stands out. Let's give him more opportunities. Hey, she's a much stronger candidate, let's hire her. And so you're gonna get more opportunities, more promotions, better jobs. That will again translate into earnings, into success, into achieving what you wanna do. Mm -hmm. And again, it's not about being the greatest leader, the greatest negotiator. If we just get a little bit better, it has a massive return. And if in your whole organization, everyone gets a little bit better, imagine if everyone in your organization was 2% better, what would that do to your bottom line? So mm -hmm. absolutely, organizations should be looking at how to do this, how to improve these skills across the board. Certainly. Okay. And I'd like to unpack that in, in a little bit, but let me, let me ask you this, Mark, uh, what would you say is your personal area of strength? That's a good question. One thing I do, I'm going to tie this back to the ballroom. Sure. There were some ballroom champions and what I learned from them, they were really world-class ballroom dancers. And 
their training was they looked at whatever their worst step was. So in ballroom, we have different, different steps, right? Our routine is we'll do this step and that step. They would look at whatever their worst step was and they put that into their routine to force themselves to train up on their weaknesses. And that was insightful when I heard it. One of the things I have done is I look at whatever my area of weakness is and that's where I focus. Mm. So I wouldn't say I have one area. Obviously, I'm, I'm very technical. Now, that's a domain skill. Mm -hmm. Am I an outstanding leader as compared to my negotiation skills, as compared to my team building skills? You know, I wouldn't say I am super exceptional in one above the others because I intentionally say I'm feeling very strong here, but not so much there. Let me go focus on that weakness. Mm -hmm. Certainly. Okay. Uh, and what would you say is something in that area of strength that businesses don't know, but should? Well, it's, it's recognizing that you do need this diversity of skills, mm -hmm. right? Unfortunately, too many people within companies are siloed. They focus on their area of expertise, and that might be their industry as a whole. Most commonly, it's that functional area, mm -hmm. just in finance, just in sales, just in engineering. And unfortunately, by doing so, they take a very narrow perspective. They miss opportunities to say, you know, as I'm an engineer trying to build this, if I understood the customer a little bit from talking to salespeople, if I understood just how we invoice and bill and what the challenges are and why we have all these outstanding payments coming, maybe I could design the product slightly differently. And yes, in theory, the product person should be the one saying, I'm pulling all this together. Mm -hmm. In reality, in our companies, they're big and complex. Yeah. And no one person understands it all. The more you can foster these direct interactions, people from different departments coming together and interacting and learning a little more, mm -hmm. the stronger your organization will be. So I would encourage all organizations to create programs, and we can talk about how to do that, to foster that internal networking, to build those internal relationships. You can start with something as simple as just doing lunch and learns, mm -hmm. but then there are even better techniques that will really advance the capabilities of your company. Certainly. And, and I would concur with that. I, I understand that way of thinking. However, from a practical point of view, because there are different personalities within an organization, some of whom may be what we would call introverts, who perhaps don't quite think actively or proactively in terms of how do I advance my skills and soft skills and, and areas of negotiation, etc. Is this something that extroverts would take to more naturally than introverts? Or is there hope for those who are perhaps a little, little quieter, but not any less ambitious? Yeah, I, I think those are actually orthogonal issues. And by the way, I happen to be an introvert. Okay. Introversion versus extroversion is really about how you do with groups of people, even strangers at times. And so like when we think about networking, this is a classic one where people say, oh, I'm an introvert. I, I'm not a networker. Well, when we think about networking, that Hollywood example is the person who goes into the room and in 30 minutes, he comes back with 20 new business cards. He goes, yeah, I got all these business cards. Introverts will never want to do that. Talking to 20 new people in 30 minutes. Yeah. Oh my God, that's torture. But that's not networking. That's collecting business cards. Mm -hmm. Networking is relationship building. Anyone who's ever had a friend knows how to network and introverts can do that. Mm -hmm. Introverts know how to actually chat with people, but they prefer to do so one-on-one, -on -one, not on that crowded conference room floor. So we just have to recognize they're going to engage differently. And extroverts might love, oh yeah, a group of six people. I'm going to meet all six of you at once. Mm -hmm. The introvert would prefer, hey, let's meet one-on-one -on -one for coffee in some quiet place. So we just have to recognize we have different approaches to how we do things. And in terms of developing these skills, I, I don't think introversion or extroversion has anything to do with it. The example I gave earlier about, hey, if you learn to negotiate, look at how much more money you can get, that universally appeals to people. And it's just how they might approach it. An extrovert might say, okay. oh, I want to do a class. The introvert mm -hmm. says, I want to read a book. Right. Okay. No right. In, in thinking about how this applies to organizations, quite often there is a, a leadership or a cultural issue that probably hinders 
the organization in some of these aspects that you describe in your book. I was wondering if, if you, if the book actually does address more fundamental cultural and leadership issues. So I do talk about that. I think in many cases, I talk about what company culture means. Mm -hmm. And I think in many cases, company culture is actually, it's a misnomer. It, it gets misused because people think culture is, well, we have these seven values. Look, they're on our website. Now you do these seven values and you're a fit. Yeah. First, most companies don't actually follow those values. Yeah. They're just, they're up there for show. And I know they mean well, but they don't actually live and breathe them. Mm -hmm. A few do, many don't. But more than cultural fit, it is about communication. It's how we communicate. I give an example, a colleague of mine said, he worked in a company where whoever shouted the loudest won. Anytime there was a debate, it's basically whoever shouted, that's the person who won the debate. That I am certain is not one of their cultural values. That's not listed up on the website, shout <laughs> loud. But that de facto is what happened in the company. And so we have to recognize how are people communicating? How are problems getting solved? Is it a place where there's open disagreement? Is it a place where you have to do coalition building? Is it a place that uses lots of emails? Is it a place that prefers face-to-face -face meetings? These are usually more telling of how an organization operates. And people who, for example, prefer face-to-face -face meetings, if that's the culture of the company, and someone else just likes sending emails, it's, oh, you know, this, why doesn't Barbara just come over and talk to me? This is really frustrating. And that's going to cause more of a problem than whether Barbara is truly customer focused or not. Mm -hmm. So I think communication is really the, the challenge more than what people call culture. Certainly. Okay. And your book, as I understand it, is divided into three sections, career, <laughs> leadership, and management. Uh, and interpersonal, sorry, four sections, a career, three, leadership and management and interpersonal dynamics. Have I That's got right. that right? Yep. Why break it into those three sections? I mean, career and interpersonal dynamics, I can uh, sort of understand, but uh, actually leadership and management and interpersonal dynamics, I can understand, but you start with career and a career plan. Yeah. Why, so why let's, that? let's look at the, the sections. And of course I want to emphasize there are books on any one of these topics. One reason I put all together is first, no one wants to read 10 books these days, so but true. then also these skills all reinforce each other. It's not like you can be a leader and not be a good communicator, right? They all kind of interplay. So I'm, I'm going to talk about them in reverse that last section, interpersonal dynamics, communication, negotiation, networking, and ethics. This underpins anything that we do. Right. Leadership and management I break it down. There's a chapter on leadership and I, I'm explicit about separating them. A chapter on people management and a chapter on process management. And I really get to the fundamental pieces of each. What is the essence that means to be a manager today, to manage a process, to be a leader? And then you can take these and use them however you want. One of the most important things, especially for some of the younger readers, is recognizing that leadership and management is not from the title. You don't wait till you get this title and say, now I'm a manager, now I'm a leader. It's something we all do. And when you look at what those fundamental pieces are, you begin to realize it. Now that first section career, these are kind of skills that relate directly to your job. So chapter one, how to create a career plan. When you say, you know, I'm here, but this is where I want to be in five years and 10 years. How do you map out a path to get there? Chapter two, working effectively, how to manage your manager, understanding company culture, understanding the value that you are providing to your internal customers or your external customers, dealing with office politics. These are all the skills you need to be effective at your job that of course we've never told you about. And then chapter three, interviewing. Now interviewing, there's no shortage of content on interviewing. Oh, how do I answer this question? How do I write a good resume? Unfortunately, we have never taught people how to hire. I have met countless executives. They've hired lots of people and you ask them, have you ever had any interview training? They say, no. So now imagine, but they say, well, you know, I've been in interviews. Do I know how to cook? Well, yeah, as a kid, you know, I watched my mom. I guess I could cook things. Do you want me running a restaurant? Of course not. 
if I was supposed to, you'd send me for training. You'd send me to some professional culinary school. Well, if hiring people is so important for the jobs that we do, these white power jobs, these intellectual information jobs, hiring people is so important. Why have we done zero training in how to hire? It goes back to negotiation, it's not being the world's greatest hirer, but just investing a little time to get a little more effective makes us so much better and gives us a massive return. So I talk about interviewing from the hiring perspective there. So that first section is all about kind of on the job, concrete skills related to your job. Okay, so the career plan, uh, you, you start with that. For those of us who may not have uh, a career plan or be familiar with it, could you describe it and, and tell us how to approach it? Sure. What you want to do is look to the future. Most people think about maybe their next job, but really this comes from my background as a chess player. You don't think one move ahead, mm -hmm. you try to think six or seven. Right. Look to where you want to be long-term. Say, so, okay, here's a job I want in, let's say 10 years. Well, if I'm gonna be there in 10 years, where do I need to be in seven years, in five years, in three years? Okay, where are the skills I need to get that job in five years? Okay, so I have to gain these skills. I need this type of experience. How do you set yourself up? So you're going to create a path to that future job. And in fact, there might be multiple paths there. You might not have one future job. You might have, well, I'm, I'm going in this direction and I'll kind of figure out the details later. So I talk about different ways you can do this and you can start from saying, what's the goal? Work your way backwards and create plans that of course are gonna be more concrete in the short term and a little fuzzier as you go out. Now, the important thing with plans because people say, well, you can't plan for this stuff. You, you never know what's going to happen. Of course, if any of us ever went to our boss and said, hey, listen, this project we're doing for the next six months, look, I'm not gonna bother giving you a project plan because we all know we're not gonna stick to that plan exactly. So why even waste our time? I was like, hey, no way, make that plan. I'm not expecting you to follow it exactly. We know it's gonna be some variance, but let's have a plan. Same thing with our careers that last not six months, but years. So you're gonna make this plan, but very important, like any project we do, you're going to revise that plan. Your goals might change or your steps along the way might change. And that's perfectly acceptable. Certainly. What about exploring areas that we may not be familiar with and don't really have anyone in our network who would be able to speak to that? For example, let's say I was working at a bank, I had an aspiration to uh, become uh, a senior VP of something or the other within the bank, but then get a bit disillusioned and say, no, I want to strike out on my own. But I don't have anyone who has any entrepreneurial experience outside in my network. How do I begin to align myself so that I'm better positioned to begin that journey? Yeah, I think the challenge there is you've limited yourself with the assumption that I don't have anyone in my network. Mm -hmm. We have to remember our network is not simply the people we know, but the people they know and so on. That is our network. Right. It's extended. And I believe most of us will have someone, maybe not directly, mm -hmm. someone who has done that, who's been down that path. In the worst case, if you have gone to college, look at your alumni database and reach out and find someone in the alumni database who has done something similar to what you're looking to do and say, look, hey, I'm a fellow alum. Can I just get 30 minutes of your time? Mm -hmm. That works most of the time. Right. So you, you have to just take a diverse, wide perspective on what encompasses your network. Mm -hmm. And this is certainly the way to start is you want to find people who have been down there and talk to them to learn more. What is that path like? Help illuminate it for me so I can go down it and not stumble. Certainly. Okay. I believe you also talk about being able to work effectively and interviewing skills as, as part of the career section. Is, is that correct? Yes, uh, yes. And you refer to something called the airport test. Could you tell us a bit about that? The airport test, this goes back to the eighties. It's been misattributed to a number of companies over the years, but now think back to the 1980s. This is before we had the internet in our pocket and airports didn't have really nice lounges. Okay, so now you're a consultant mm -hmm. and you flew off, you spent the week at your client in Des Moines, Iowa, some relatively tiny city. So we're not talking 
DC or New York or these large airports, you have a tiny airport. And as you're sitting there with your coworker waiting for your flight, you hear, oh, by the way, flight's delayed three hours. So now you're stuck for three hours, nothing to do. There's no coffee shop, no internet in your pocket, and you've got three hours in this boring airport with your coworker. Do you want to be there with this coworker? Will you find this person interesting or boring? And this is the airport test. And so some people have said, it's really important that they pass this, right? That this is who you want to spend time with. In fact, in the US presidential election, one of the reasons people say Bush won over Gore is effectively the airport test. Who would you want to have a beer with? People said right. George Bush, right? Al Gore, he seems a little stiff and boring. Mm -hmm. So some companies really value that. Is it important? You know, it depends. There's an argument to be made that, yeah, you should like your coworkers, and especially if you're gonna be in kind of close quarters, spending a lot of time with them. If you are gonna be stuck in airports with them where there's no internet access, okay, yeah, probably you want that. On the other hand, look, your coworkers don't need to be your best friend. You don't need to necessarily wanna hang out with them on weekends. As long as you have a professional relationship and are competent, that might be sufficient. I was a fan of the show Mythbusters and Adam and Jamie, two really great engineers who came up with creative and brilliant things, they did not get along. You can even see in the show, they really have different personalities. And after the show was off, they came, came out and said, yeah, you know, we're, we don't hang out, we're not friends, but they respected each other. Why the show worked is even though they didn't necessarily even like each other as people, they said, look, when we had a challenge, we both put forth our ideas, we both respected the capabilities of the other people and said, oh, okay, you know what? Your idea is better than mine. Let's do that. And they are professional about it. So whether or not the airport test matters, it's really up for a company to decide. Right. As a candidate, better to pass it than not. But you as a hiring manager have to decide, is this an important factor? Certainly. Okay. Are there any other skills that you believe we should be aware of, uh, especially as we think about our own careers? Well, I would say all the skills in the book, certainly. <laughs> yep. These really do matter, how we communicate with other people, having basic leadership and management skills, again, even if you're not at that level. Mm -hmm. Fitting into company culture and what I have in that working effectively chapter, those are probably less talked about because we've all heard, okay, right, leadership, yeah, I've heard that yep. before, communications, build my network, but we don't talk about things like managing your manager or understanding how to build relationships and fit into the company. And I think those are really subtle skills that unfortunately can hinder your career. We're trained in college to get the right answer, right? Literally your professor mm -hmm. teaches you some things and says, here's the paper, here's the test. And you kind of know, okay, right. Get that answer, use whatever I just learned the past few weeks, put the answer in the box and that's what it takes to succeed. Mm -hmm. In reality, our boss doesn't say, oh, here's the formula, here's what you need. There's the box, go use the formula, get the answer put in the box. Your boss says, figure this out. And learning how to do that, learning how to engage with other people and fit into this larger ecosystem, that is really important and rarely talked about. So with, with the skills that you just talked about, they seem fairly intangible. So if I were to say, okay, th these, I recognize that these are important, but how do I measure my ability to get a handle on these and make progress? How would, how would I approach that? Sorry, you, you're on mute, uh, Mark, I think. Yes, sorry about <laughs> that. These are indeed a little intangible. You're right about that. How we need to think about is perhaps a little qualitatively. Dory Clark, who's written some great business books, said one thing we can do to assess ourselves is we can ask someone, can you give me three adjectives that describe me? Right, just this will help me understand how am I seen, right? Am I seen as a leader? Am I seen as intellectual? Am I seen as difficult to work with? Give me three adjectives. We can use those techniques within an area. You know, give me some advice as a leader, what do you see as my strengths or weaknesses, right? And you can ask people and you can get this feedback. There's no objective, you, you get a 4.6 on this leadership scale. I think that's mm -hmm. a little fuzzy. So we have to use more qualitative methods and feedback is so important.
from our peers, from our managers, even from our subordinates. Make sure you get that feedback regularly to assess yourself. I'm thinking of my past experiences in the corporate world where feedback and these performance reviews that were mandatory within the organization were done not so much with the idea of helping individuals lift their game, so to speak, but rather how'd you go? We need to tick a few boxes and get it over and done with. There is talk around how, how could you develop yourself and what things could you do, but often none of it ever gets actioned. As uh, a candidate and potential manager or leader within the organization in the future, how do we approach this? As an individual, Remember, no one is more responsible for your career than you. Mm -hmm. It's great if your company has this assessment. It's even better if they actually use it to help develop you. Yeah. But don't sit there and wait for them to do it. You have to take responsibility for managing and directing your own career. If you are a leader, then I believe leaders, we have responsibilities to those who report to us mm -hmm. and to help them develop use this and say, I'm not just going to say, well, here you go. You've got your feedback. Best of luck to you. Say, what can we do to help develop you? I see here's an area. You said you're interested in developing it. We've identified it. Let's work together and create that plan. And I talk about when you have your development plan, how to reach out to HR or your managers and try and get input from them. Doesn't mean they're going to be responsive to that, but yeah. you can at least ask. And I think as we become leaders in our organizations, we need to proactively do this. And I give some examples on my website of how you can build training programs within your organization. Certainly, okay. Do you find that in, in some organizations, at least there is very much a focus on what you can do to add to the revenue figure? In other words, if the skills could potentially help boost the revenue figure, okay. If it doesn't bring a direct correlation to that figure, why are we talking about it? is almost the attitude that we get. Is this something, again, that you need to be proactive about and, and negotiate uh, with uh, your, your bosses, or is there uh, a different way of looking at it? A good manager should understand it's not just direct, right? We know, for example, salespeople, what value do they add to the company? Well, very clear, they added X dollars in revenue. How much did that product manager or that accountant add? It's hard to say directly they brought in this much money, so we have to kind of indirectly estimate. So same thing, if for example, you're in a role facing with vendors or customers, you might say, ooh, okay, negotiation skills. I know exactly how being a better negotiator will help the company. Mm -hmm. But in fact, if we all learn to be better at negotiating, we negotiate internally quite a lot. We negotiate with our managers, we negotiate with our coworkers. And if you got better at negotiating, if everyone in the company did, now you're gonna have less conflict, you're gonna have better, more creative solutions Mm -hmm. You can't directly say, oh, that added X dollars, but it will have an impact. Communication, you can't say, oh, that email was so much more clear because if it had been like your old email, we would have lost so much time and confusion. Hard to measure that, but we know there's value in communication, even if it's not directly measured. Mm -hmm. So hopefully a good manager recognizes there, there are some not direct, but kind of secondary benefits that you get from learning these skills that will impact the bottom line. So, okay. so a negotiation, negotiation is a, a skill set, and I, I think you class that under the, uh, sorry, the yeah, interpersonal, interpersonal dynamics section. Communication is often talked about and, and certainly essential in, in anyone's working life, but negotiation seems to be a bit of a gray area. And, and yes, there are experts out there with, you know, who teach that and, and have some books uh, on it as well. But again, I would struggle with this idea of being able to improve my negotiation skills in a tangible way and, and have perhaps some milestones or metrics, if I will, if you will, to, to measure my progress. Negotiation, I'm going to give you a just kind of back of the envelope qualitative example, and mm -hmm. then some quantitative examples. Okay. Qualitatively, imagine the following. If you've ever done public speaking, if you've ever played sports, even on your company sports team, mm -hmm. do you ever just show up and say, oh, here's a softball game, or here's the talk I have to do. Okay, I'm gonna show up and think I know what I'm doing. Let's just do the talk. Of course not, everyone knows, you know, you do much better if you actually practice, right? Or to practice games, if you maybe practice your talk before you do it. Right. Now, some people practice it 
extensively and they are these great you know ted level speakers where they have these perfectly polished speeches others just okay i'm presenting in front of the company i can say some uh ums and ahs and it, it's okay and i'll oh wait uh, right right here we go but as long as i get my point across that's fine and that just takes a, a certain amount of practice negotiations the same thing right if you spend a little bit of time preparing planning what I'm going to offer, what might they want, what might they be offering, thinking a little bit about this, mm -hmm. you're going to get a much better outcome. Studies have actually shown that a little bit of preparation improves your outcome. And in, in these research studies have been done in academia, but no one preps for negotiations. They just kind of say, okay, let's just walk in and wing it. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, from other areas, a little bit of preparation goes a long way. That applies here as well, but in a more quantitative measure, when this is taught at the university level, they actually have a number of case studies. So we will role play and we'll both be in negotiation and you know, maybe I'm, some, I'm selling some land and you're looking to buy and there's land and there's mineral rights and there's all these different aspects to it. We're going to negotiate. They can actually, so here we're negotiating for real dollars, real mineral, mineral rights, real timing, mm -hmm. uh, real, obviously it's imaginary, but these are quantitative values. And so they can measure the outcome and see, we're going to do it, but there's going to be a hundred other teams that are going to do the same negotiation. How do we do compared to them? And so we can measure, did we reach some optimal outcome? Did we do better than the average person? So there are some quantitative measures that can be done as you train up in negotiations. I'm trying to break this down in, in my mind as, as you were talking about it, because they can seem to be a number of different variables. Uh, and often I, I tend to get the deer in the headlights kind of uh, uh, attitude in my brain when there are a number of different variables as to which ones do I pick to work on and how do I measure those variables. If you are starting off in, in this um, whole area of negotiation and you don't really have a very good comfort level with it, what would be one or two things that you could focus on uh, in so order to just up your game a bit. What you've noted, this is a common misconception with negotiations. It's, mm -hmm. okay, there's six different things we're doing. This seems complex. All right, mm -hmm. well, let's just focus on this one. But in fact, in negotiations, you want to negotiate multiple topics at once. You're actually better. Now you might not do all six, you might do two or three at a time. Mm -hmm. What this allows is for me to trade off and concede on things that are less valuable to me that seem important to you, mm -hmm. but really focus and push for things that are more important to me that you seem to be more willing to concede on. And in doing so, I can gain more in the important areas, giving up the less important ones, and you do the same, we both wind up happier. So this is a, a common misconception that you should do one at a time. In fact, you should do multiple uh, options together. And doing a little bit of training. In my book, there's one chapter up. I talk about concepts like this, how to prepare a few other basic things. Mm -hmm. It's not going to make you the world's greatest negotiator, but just when you say, oh, you know what? In the future, I'm not going to do one at a time. Already you're a better negotiator. So picking up a couple basic techniques like this, read a book, whether it's mine or some other great books I list on the website, read one of those and you'll already be much stronger. Certainly. I, I certainly get that point. Uh, I was wondering, how do I make sure that I have learned something in the negotiation exercise, you know, whether it be for a pay rise or, or to acquire a good deal on a bit of software that would impact the organization? Should I uh, approach it as, okay, this is going to be my pitch. And really, all I want to do is ensure that they acknowledge that there is a value in four or out of the six six points that we negotiate and, and they see value in that uh, and we agree on that that that, that i would class as a win uh, i'm not going to be perfect uh, if, if we get the deal terrific but at the very least i should be walking away with some understanding uh, mutual understanding that is of the value that we bring across four points uh, would, would that be i guess a fair a way of examining the exercise? So yeah, this is another technique that before you even go into negotiation, determine what would be valuable to you. At what point do you say, yes, I would like an agreement that offers this. Mm -hmm. If it doesn't offer at least that, I shouldn't even sign the agreement in the first place. Mm -hmm. And so understanding your BATNA, 
best alternative to negotiate agreement. That's your walk away awesome. point. Understanding potential outcomes you might want, your aspirational outcome, your realistic outcomes. This type of planning already makes you a better negotiator. And so these are some of the techniques that are talked about in my book and pretty much in all negotiation books. Certainly. Okay. While we're on the area of interpersonal dynamics, what about networking? Is there some way of uh, approaching networking that allows for deeper relationships? Well, it's, it's changing that mindset mm -hmm. of saying it's the number of business cards I collected. Mm -hmm. I often tell my students, because people think, unfortunately, with social media, it's the number of followers, it's the number of friends. Just because you added someone on LinkedIn, saying they're in your network, that's like saying someone who swiped right on you on Tinder is now your significant other. Yes, you both matched, but would you say, oh, yep, that's it. She's going to be my wife because we both swiped right. Of course not. We haven't built the relationship. And so when you look at metrics like number of followers, number of people swiped right on Tinder, that's not what's really valuable. Now, networking, I wouldn't say it's quantitative. It's not the number of people. And it's hard to measure that relationship. Mm -hmm. But we all know intuitively if you needed a really big favor, if you needed someone to you know, help you move next weekend, are you asking the person you just met at the bar last week? Or are you asking friends who you've known for years? Mm -hmm. right? We know relationships take time to build. And you can, I'll say, kind of roughly measure it by the size of the favor you can ask. Right. And we need to balance. We want diversity in our networks. And that means meeting a lot of people. And they might not all be close friends of ours. They might not all come help us move. Mm -hmm. But then there's also that depth. And when you make that mental shift, and this is one of the key things in the book, that there's a shift that happens in each chapter. When you go from, oh, I have 10,000 connections on LinkedIn. I'm networked mm -hmm. to, OK, I only have 800 connections. But every one of them is going to return my phone call every one of them would reach out and help me as opposed to 10,000. Most of them would say, yeah, who are you? I see we're connected, but I have no idea who you are. Mm -hmm. So it's changing how you perceive what your network is. Certainly. Uh, and is there a, a, a different way to approach this, especially given the circumstances that we live in uh, currently and tools that are by and large reinforcing that like LinkedIn? Well, COVID, this is where that shift really makes a difference. Now, COVID, of course, is a terrible predicament we're all in. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, it will end soon. Most people said, oh, COVID, that's it. No more networking because I can't go out to the bar or the conference mm -hmm. and get 20 business cards. And yes, that's made it harder. But when you remember that is that 1% of networking, if we go back to that Tinder analogy, swiping right is like the tiny first step of the relationship. What's the relationship? It's now going on dates for the next six months. Yeah. In that network, getting that business card, okay, that's that first tiny step. What's really the part of networking? It's building that relationship. Mm -hmm. That we can do virtually. In fact, that now that we're not commuting to work, we all gain back, what, 30 minutes every morning, every evening. So if you did a virtual coffee twice a week, and said, hey, you know what? Every Tuesday morning, I do a virtual coffee. It's been six months. Let's catch up, right? You can use that time to network. Even better, we tend to network in person, which, of course, is enjoyable. But that means I'm networking primarily with people in New York, mm -hmm. maybe in San Francisco or other cities when I'm there. But now, of course, that we're all online, I can call anyone anywhere and say, let's do a virtual coffee. No one was going to do that in 2018. Mm. So we can use this to our advantage when we shift our mindset to relationship building and not just collecting business cards. Certainly. Okay. There's another interesting component I think you added in your book, which is ethics. Talk to us about that in, in terms of why you feel it, it uh, belongs in, under interpersonal dynamics, one, and, and how we can go about de developing that skill set. Interpersonal dynamics, that's really a catch-all for how we interact with other people. Mm -hmm. And ethics underpin the nature of the relationship that we have with other people. Right. Ethics is the type of thing everyone says, oh, yeah, be ethical. Yeah, that's it. But we're not going to put time into training you, time into supporting it. Just be ethical. And people, they mean well, but we really put no effort behind it. I think that's unfortunate. I have seen far too many ethical lapses in organizations, ranging from just small things where people 
bend the rules and think, well, okay, or, you know, I know, I know the other folks do this, to unfortunately far too often large ethical lapses. I've seen sexual harassment far too often over the past decades of my career, and people aren't standing up. Finally, we're starting to with the Me Too movement as a society. But individually, certainly people said, yeah, it, it's not good, right? Because it was, I think, a relatively small number of people doing the infractions, larger than it should be, but I don't think most people are inherently bad, but people didn't want to speak up. People didn't want to do anything about it and teaching people, hey, it's okay. We can and should and need to do this is important. I give the analogy of fire drills. As a kid, I grew up and in school, we do a fire drill, right? And I pull up, and, okay, students, we're gonna line up and walk, don't run and go to the exit. And I've been building for the fire alarm has gone off. No one's running, no one's shoving. We're like, okay, yeah, fire alarm. Okay, we've been trained for this. What do we do? Walk calmly, use the stairs, not the elevator. But when there's an ethical issue, we've had no training. Mm -hmm. You get that deer and hell, oh, what, what do we do? And there is time pressure, there's peer pressure. And with no training, people will panic or people just choose not to act. So I think we need to train people up and we need to be proactive and conscious and thinking about it. Certainly in my field, in software, it's become even more important because we've seen how algorithms and AI can have ethical implications now outside of the organization. There are secondary effects. And if we're not proactive in thinking about them, we're going to have some very bad side effects and consequences. So are you suggesting that organizations should bring up these topics and talk about it? Is that the best way to prepare? Absolutely. They, they should. I don't just mean your annual sexual harassment training or, you know, here's our don't steal office supplies. Yes, you need to do those things, but let's have real discussions, real discussions about how to engage, real discussions about how our products and services impact our employees, our shareholders, our customers, our partners, the community and society at large. Let's actually have that conversation. And what you're going to find to that first piece, that internal dealing with infractions, mm -hmm. you're not alone in thinking this is wrong. And when you realize that most other people say, yeah, this is wrong, it's easier to speak up when you know there are other people who are going to speak up with you. Within that second piece, how we think about the impact on the world, just having that conversation once in a while makes you more aware. And as you think about the product and service and client engagement, it's going to be in the back of your mind and you'll be more attuned to opportunities and risks. So okay. that at least brings to my mind that culture uh, and leadership is, is really key because if you don't set the right tone there, no matter how many of these exercises you engage in, they don't necessarily, they may not necessarily be productive or honest. Uh, it has to come from the top. Just okay. putting something on your web on your website saying this is yeah. valuable or, oh yeah, once a year, make sure you check the box and do the training. No, you need to lead by example. And mm -hmm. as leaders, we need to say, this is important. We're putting time into this. You need to put time into this too. So on the topic of leadership, are you of the belief that everyone needs to have leadership qualities or potential? A hundred percent. Everyone should have leadership qualities. And one of the things that we teach to our students, even if you say, I never want to be a leader, I want to sit here as an individual contributor, those leadership qualities will serve you well as a follower. So you should develop them because they will help you, even if you never want to be up at the front of the room. Okay. How so? Well, think about what are the skills? I'm going to leave this as an exercise mm -hmm. to the audience. Think for a moment. You can, you can pause this. Write down what are the skills you want in a leader. Take a moment, create that list. Okay, now that you've come back, you have that list. Pause it again and write down what are the qualities you want in a follower. You're going to find these lists are remarkably similar. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So in, in, in managing people, it's, I guess, a key one that comes to mind is communication. But apart from communication, what other processes or, or skill sets do we need to be aware of? 
It's, it's very broad. I, this is why I break it down to people and process. On the right. people side, understanding what motivates people, understanding how people interact, how we can create effective teams. <clears throat> Excuse me. This is, I think, so critical. Any manager you speak to will tell you the hardest part of her job is the people side of it. It's not the process side. It's the herding cats. It's the managing people. And so that, I think, really we have to spend time focusing on understanding people and their motivations. We spend a lot of time on the processes. And that is important. But if we don't understand the people, we're not going to be effective managers. On the process side, there's no shortage of books, lean and agile and how to do project plans and whatever the, the hot thing du jour is. Mm -hmm. Read those, but you're going to recognize there are common themes among them. And it has to do with balancing between time and risk and making trade-offs between different facets of the project. Once you understand that, then you can start to recognize for any process, you take that off the shelf process, you take what you get from the book, but now you can start to tune it. And you're not simply a slave to, uh, okay, the book says do this. So yeah, okay, but we're gonna tweak it. We're gonna optimize it for what we need because I understand what we have to do, how our company works. Always make sure the process you, the process you apply follows your needs and don't shift your needs to whatever the process says. So, okay, but we, and in saying what you just said, it brings to my mind at least the idea of motivation because uh, motivation to follow through on particular courses of action is probably a huge thing. Yet we really aren't taught to understand people's motivations or to flesh it out in the course of a conversation in a way that all parties can understand it and work forward as a result of it. Do you have any suggestions in, in, in that regard? I reference a couple of different motivational theories, mm -hmm. but here I really reference what are academic papers into a paragraph each. Right. But even just becoming aware that not everyone is motivated the same way, mm -hmm. that already is a huge shift for many managers and going, wow, okay, the way I motivate Carol, that's going to be different than how I motivate Alice. Yeah. And once you recognize that, you realize I'm going to have to start to adjust and there's not one size fits all. Mm -hmm. As you explore this topic further, and I give some resources on the website, you can then be more deliberate in how you're going to motivate each of them differently. But I think even just getting that shift of, not one size fits all, that already is so important to our management, to how we're going to motivate and engage people. Mm -hmm. Okay, certainly. There's obviously quite a lot in, in, in the book and, and the topics that we've just discussed. Putting it all together can seem like a bit of a challenge. Uh, and I think you've done a good job in, in certainly com compressing some of the key aspects of it together in, in your book. But is there, I guess, a goalpost or yeah, a goalpost that we should be aiming for in terms of, you know, ensuring that the organization is on the same page when it comes to these skill sets? I don't think there's any, here is an objectively measurable goalpost because mm -hmm. these are qualitative skills and there's a lot of them. But let me talk for a moment about how we can imbibe an organization with these skills, mm -hmm. how we can do it at an organization level, not just an individual level. Because when you do it this way, there's some secondary benefits. Most of how we've learned in the past has been information transfer. The teacher has stood at the front of the room and said, this is what to do. And we sat there and we memorized it. We memorized the date of the Magna Carta. We memorized the chemical formula for salt, whatever it is they were teaching us. And then we regurgitated that on our tests. And this is high school. This is most of college, unfortunately. Even in our corporate training, if they are rolling out an accounting system next week, what happens? Well, this week, they're going to say, you're going to learn the accounting system. And we're going to teach you, here are the commands, and here's the codes, and here's how to use it. You say, okay, well, next Monday at 9 a.m., I'm going to use the new accounting system. We do just-in-time knowledge transfer. And that is fine. That is a great way to teach what we've had to teach. When it comes to these skills, that doesn't work. The just in time doesn't work and the knowledge transfer doesn't work. So let's look at both of those. From a knowledge transfer standpoint, 
There's not, these are the three steps to be a leader. You don't say here's the algorithm for networking, mm -hmm. right? These are complex ideas. The way we teach them at MIT, the way they are taught at top business schools around the world is through a peer learning method. So you get someone, the professor or someone who says, I'm gonna put some ideas out there, but then you're going to each consume them. You read it as the paper or the book, whatever, but then we discuss them. And this is the key point because in those business school classes, you have a former teacher or a former military officer, former consultant, former salesperson, and they all bring different perspectives. And when we talk, I'm going to hear you say, oh, this is how you'd approach it. Wow, I never would have thought of that. I would have done it totally differently. Now I have a deeper understanding whether I shift my own version of leadership or communication or however, because I can incorporate some of what you do. Or even if I say, yeah, you know, I'm, that's really not for me. Even just being aware, now I can recognize when others are using that style of leadership. You go, okay, yeah, this isn't really resonating for me. But I get, he's not, he's not a jerk. He's not a bad leader. He has a different leadership style. And I get it now because I learned that from you. And so by having these conversations, we get a richer understanding of these skills. Now, then you get some other benefits. I mentioned it's not just in time. You don't say, hey, here's a leadership class you're taking today because at 217 next Thursday, you have to be a leader. It's never so obvious. We know when we have to use that accounting knowledge for the new system, we don't know boom, I have to be a leader now, or now I have a communication issue. So by creating these peer learning groups that meet on a regular cadence, say twice a month, now you have, it stays top of mind, right? It continues to be in the forefront of our thinking. So when opportunities come up, we're more quick to recognize the opportunity to learn and to apply our skills. Then you get two other benefits when you do it as a group within your company. First, you want that diversity. You don't just want, here's the engineering group and here's the accounting group and they're all learning separately. You create these groups where you take an accountant, you take a salesperson, you take an engineer. So they bring their different perspectives. Now you're building up that intra-company network. You're building those relationships. That's always great. It's better for employee engagement. It's better for the communication within your company. And that second added benefit, when you use a book, you can all say, oh, this is just like chapter eight, right? You know, that's the example with the elephant. You go, oh, right, okay, yeah, I get. And so you've built a common language and framework. Now I'll note, I have on my website, there's a free download on the resources page that explains how you can create this for your group and organization. Yes, you can use my book. This is not a ploy to sell more books. If you don't want to use my book, use one of the other great books listed there. Pick your own books, pick articles you find online, take wonderful podcasts like this and say each week, we're gonna discuss this podcast. The content can be whatever you want. So you can use my book or not, but creating these peer learning groups, this is how you're going to create great learning, that richer understanding along with better employee engagement. So would you say that it would be reinforced better if the peer learning groups were to take some sort of action as a result of the outcomes from those discussions? In some cases, absolutely. And in the download, there's two of them. So one is how to create a plan and HR people, you can take this, cross out my name, put your name and say, look at this brilliant plan I came up with. Enjoy, take all the credit. There's also a spreadsheet that has a timeline that explains how you can break it down. It does so for my book, but you can do a similar thing for other books, but then also concrete action items. So there might be cases where you say, let's not just discuss negotiation, let's actually run a negotiation simulation. Let's actually, if we're talking about our career plans, let's actually each make career plans and then bring it back and discuss it. And let's review your career plan, let's review mine, because I'm gonna learn about your career plan. Oh, you know, you have a really clever idea there and how you're thinking about your career, I'm gonna incorporate that to mine. Mm -hmm. So some go beyond just discussion and have examples of action items. And it's really up to you, depending on the content you take, you can create discussions or exercises or action items and takeaways for people to do to learn. Okay. Mark, I'm just conscious of time escaping uh, us. There's a, a lot that uh, we need to digest, but is there an aspect or a skill set that we haven't quite covered but should highlight? I think we've, we've gotten to most of it. 
again, all these skills will reinforce each other. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't just focus purely on one. Although for individual development, if you think about as you're learning basketball, you might say, I'm going to focus the next few months on my shooting right? That's really where I'm going to put my time. You focus on your shooting. Once you get better there, now you say, okay, let's work on my passing. Let's work on my defense, right? It's what that couple did in ballroom where they said, we're going to take our weakest area, focus on that for a bit, and then shift and find something else that's weak. So concentrate on area for a little bit to build up that muscle memory, to build up the understanding, but rotate it around because these skills really do reinforce each other and you want to be balanced across them. So, Mark, if you were listening to this podcast episode, what would be your top takeaway? My takeaway would be, I need to create one of these learning organizations within my company. I want to download what that is, and then you know, don't even need my book if you don't want, although it's a great way to start. But let me go take a look at that. Let me set this up. It'd be great if the leaders or HR people did that. If they don't, you as an individual can do this, you know, covertly set up within your company. Just over lunch, you do it. You can set up a group of people outside your company or organization. You can set up a local meetup group to do this, but make sure you build that type of learning community because that's going to help you so much. Certainly. Matt, this has been great. If listeners are curious, want to find out more or connect with you, where would you recommend they head to? They can go to my website, thecareertoolkitbook.com. There you can learn more about the book, see where to buy it, Amazon, Barnes & Nobles, local bookstores, eBooks. You can get in touch with me. You can go to the resources page and get all these great resources like how to build this or see other books and websites explore further on these topics. You can also download the free app. There are links to the app on Android stores. When you learn a topic like this, you read it and then you forget three weeks later, because if you haven't had the ability to apply it, you're on to your next book. So the app, you don't even have to open it. It'll just pop up each day. One of the tips from the book. It's like if you took a highlighter to the book and it will help reinforce it. It's like a daily affirmation, but with the content of the book. It's also Excellent. great if you're about to walk into a negotiation or an interview or a networking event open it up and quickly go through where are the tips as a refresher for it. Mm -hmm. So you have all that on the website, thecareertoolkitbook.com. Excellent. Mark, thanks so much for doing this. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure.